Hello, everyone. I am Emeline B. Dupo, professor at the Institute of Biological Sciences and curator for moths and spiders of the entomological collection of the UPLB Museum of Natural History. So I will be your MC for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all our 120 plus participants for taking this time out to join us today for MNHS Quincentennial Commemorations webinar series, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan, with the topic, Mamiferos Terrestres Conocidos de Filipinas, Philippine Mammalian Explorations During the Spanish Colonial Period. So to start our session this morning, let us all welcome our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, who will be giving her welcome remarks. Pag-abot, Mayat Nga Tiprano. A pleasant morning to each and everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the UPLB Museum of Natural History's Quincentennial Commemoration, 10-part webinar series. The UPLB MNH Ang Pilipinas sa loob ng limang siglo features online webinar series and virtual exhibit focusing on a theme, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan. The 10-part webinar series will give us the chronicles and highlights in the Philippine natural history for the past 500 years and gaps and opportunities for research on the diverse Philippine flora and fauna. Let this also be a venue for collaborative initiatives for researchers, taxonomists, naturalists, and hobbyists to come together to promote and contribute to the natural sciences and biodiversity conservation. Last June 16, our third webinar is a recall of the herpetofaunal studies in the Philippines given by Dr. Leticia E. Afuang, MNH Curator for Reptiles and Amphibians. Her presentation, as she said, is more of a storytelling, which gave us all the consolidated herpetofaunal studies from 1521 to 2021, a collaboration with her students, and an inspiration of past, present, and prospects for herpetology in the Philippines. For those who missed, and who would like to watch again Dr. Afuang's presentation, you can still watch them by visiting the MNH uh, YouTube channel. Our webinar for today, our fourth of the 10, is a collaboration between Prof. Philip Alviola and Prof. Judeline de Malipot, MNH curators for zoological and wildlife. The presentation on Mammiferos terrestres, terrestres conocidas de Filipinas Philippine Mammalian Expeditions during the Spanish colonial period will be delivered by the bat virus hunter himself, Prof. Philip Alviola. I am sure that we are all looking forward to this presentation as Sir Philip and Mom Jude take us back to the Spanish colonial period and interesting discoveries during the period. I will let our moderator, Dr. Anna Pauline de Guia, introduce further our worst speaker. On behalf of the MNH Local Organizing Committee Chair, Mr. Florenti Cruz, and Co-Chair, Mr. Alvin Fajardo, and the MNH curators and staff, allow me to, welcome, to again welcome you all and greet you a pleasant morning. Back to you, uh, Faculty Regent Amy. Thank you, Director De Leon. Now I'll be giving the screen or turning over my screen to our moderator for today's session, Dr. Ana Pauline Odeguia, Curator for Mammals at the UPLB Museum of Natural History. Hey, Dr. Dupo, good morning everyone. Before I introduce our special guest speaker for today, I would like to remind you of the house rules. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your video is turned off. Practice good webinar etiquette. And second, please use the Zoom webinar Q&A feature to send questions. For those who are watching on our YouTube stream, just put your questions in the comments area and our technical assistant will copy your questions to the Zoom Q&A. Okay, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Philip A. Alviola. Unfortunately, Professor Judeline T. D. Malibut 
Di Malibot has internet connectivity issues from where she is based and will not be able to present today. Professor Aldiola is the MNH's curator for small mammals and other wildlife and a concurrent research associate and visiting scientist of the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, USA. He graduated from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos with a bachelor's degree in zoology and has completed a master's degree in wildlife studies, also from UPLB. He is currently taking his PhD by research program in forest biological sciences. Professor Alviola's scope of research undertakings includes bat ecology and virology, mammalian taxonomy, and systematics. He has authored and co-authored 43 scientific papers published in international and peer-reviewed journals, including bioscience, conservation biology, and emerging infectious diseases. Professor Alviola is recognized as one of the UP system's top researchers in 2018 after being chosen as one of the 100 Asian scientists by the Asian Scientist Magazine and was also awarded the 2017 NAST Outstanding Young Scientist. Friends, I now give you Batman himself, Professor Philip A. Alviola. <laughs> Maraming salamat po, Dr. Digia, for that very, very welcoming um, introduction. Okay po, so I will now start to share screen my talk. Okay, there it is. Uh, right, so as mentioned earlier, the, the title of my our talk is uh, Mammiferous Terrestres Conocidos de Filipinas, or uh, the known land mammals from the Philippines. So essentially, uh, I will be talking about the explore, explorations on Philippine mammalogy. It was done uh, during the Spanish colonial period. So yeah, resource person, ako po yan, Philip Alviola, and I am joined by Prof. Judeline de Malibot, although she will not be presenting, but she provided substantial literature in, in shaping up this presentation. Okay, so for my outline of the presentation, so there will be uh, more or less five parts. So first, uh, I will discuss the historical context, uh, exactly 1494. Uh, so there was a Spain versus Portugal, and I will be looking into the Treaty of Tordesillas as a historical background of, the, of my talk. And then second, I uh, will go into uh, the discovery, the discovery of the Philippines um, in 1521, uh, uh, looking mainly into Antonio Fig Pigafetta's mammal observations. And then afterwards in number three, so during the 1600s to 1799, I'll be discussing the early mammal records uh, coming mostly from George Camel and from the, uh, Parole's Linnaeus uh, Sistema Naturae, which was published in 1758. And then number four, uh, which actually uh, comprised the, the bulk of this, this talk, uh, is from the period of 1820 to 1898, which I will call the Great Mammalian Discoveries. And I will um, divide this, this period uh, into four, the 1820s, 1820 to 1840s, um, being <clears throat> by uh, uh, Hugh Cumming and George Waterhouse. And then you have the 1850 to 1870s with a lot of um, uh, explorers and uh, zoologists at that time. And then during the 1870s to 1870 to 1880s uh, by Nering, Hugh and Huet, uh, which I will call the, the decade of the large mammals. And then at the end, uh, you know, uh, during the 1890 uh, to 1898 towards uh, Philippine independence, so this period was uh, characterized by the Menage expedition, the Castro Elera collection, and then of course the, the tandem of John Whitehead and Oldfield Thomas. And I will end my talk with uh, the summary of important explorers and explorations. Okay, so let's start. All right, so let's start here. Okay, uh, Spain, a historical context. So during that time, so around 1400, so 1450, 1470s. So Spain, there was this um, uneasy truce or this um, between Spain and Portugal. And this was, uh, it reached a fever pitch when uh, Christopher Columbus reached the new world uh, in North America in 1492. So what essentially 
the, this voyage the, did was it threatened to intensify the rivalry between Spain and Portugal into open warfare. Um, and of course, both kingdoms wanted to claim all newly discovered lands that were not Christian. So essentially all the, the, the continents of North and South America, uh, you have the Africa, you have Asia as well. So uh, in order to counter this, uh, of course, the, the, the geopolitics of that time was a bit uh, complicated during that. So what the Pope did was, as he was the arbiter mostly of, 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 of conflicts back then in, in Western Europe, was to issue a papal bull called the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494. So what, what this treaty did was uh, there was a line of demarcation as a solution to prevent Spain and Portugal to go into war. So what, what happens is that there's a line of demarcation, an imaginary line, where the, the lands east of that line will belong to Portugal. So as uh, shown here with this uh, light blue colors of Africa, of India, some parts of the Arabian Peninsula and the, the Malay Archipelago. And then of course the lands to the West, except for a Western part of Brazil or the South America would belong to Spain. So essentially this, this um, agreement or, or papal bull um, prevented somehow the, the open war between the two great countries, the seafaring countries. Right, so during uh, in 1519 to 1522, so this is what, what uh, the Magellan Elcano circumnavigation happened. And during this expedition, Antonio Pigafetta tagged along. So, so uh, it's a Venetian scholar and explorer. So it's essentially assigned as, the, as Magellan's chronicler or the, the expedition's chronicler. And it kept records. So aside from the, the, the daily life uh, during the voyage, he also kept records of animal and plant life that was observed when they were landing on, on ports. So, so when they started from, from Seville, Spain, so they traveled uh, down south along the Atlantic Ocean, reaching uh, South America, and then um, made a beeline or, or went to the, 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 the southern tip of, uh, of South America. And then for the first time, uh, viewed the, the, the Pacific Ocean. I think probably the first Europeans to, to, to see the Pacific Ocean. And in this uh, voyage, so Pigafetta managed to, to record, um, probably um, also got some skins of several animals that, that were encountered along the way. So one of these would be the Magellanic Auk and the Patagonian Mara. And then during that voyage, actually, uh, so they also documented some species, of course, uh, for example, the leaf insect or philium in Balabac, Palawan. So this probably the probably the first, uh, first time that a European has set uh, hit its eyes or has seen a leaf insect uh, during this time. Right, so we go now to, to the mammal records in the Philippines, starting with, with Antonio Pigafetta. So uh, let me read this uh, anecdote from, from Pigafetta in, uh, okay, in Gatighan. The last name island of Gatighan, there are bats as large as eagles. As it was late, we killed only one of them, which resembled chicken in taste. So Kina and Punila, so, so they partook in the, the in one individual of a bat that was as large as an eagle. So it's probably this this the, the description of this uh, very large bat is pro would probably belong to one or one or two of the, the genera of flying foxes that are found in the Philippines. So one candidate would be your, your golden crown flying fox or the Ceridon jubatus which is uh, the largest uh, bat in the world by weight from so weighing about more than a kilo. And uh, the, the widest wingspan of any bat uh, would be your great gi uh, giant flying fox or the Turopus vampirus, which is also found in the Philippines. And what about, where did uh, Pigafetta saw, saw this? Uh, where did this uh, come from, the, the, his observation? So where exactly did he see this, um, this, this large bat? So the issue, um, the name of, of Gatighan. So from, from the accounts of Francisco Albo, who was, uh, was Victoria's navigator, one of the ships that uh, Magellan used to, for the circumnavigation. So based from his log, uh, Gatighan Islands between Bohol and Panaon Island. So there were small islands that were found here as uh, shown here with the cir red circle with, with, with question marks. But uh, Francis Guillemard in 1890 uh, opinion that 
uh, the Tikhan would be probably be located in Apit Island or Himukitan, just uh, near um, in Leyte, probably near uh, by Bay Leyte, some some uh, east, um, yeah western Leyte, and Samuel Morrison in his 1974 publication uh, thinks that uh, the location of Gatikhan would be in the Camotes Island. And there are also other mammals that Pigafetta recorded. And uh, a lot of this information comes from the publication of uh, F. Landa Jocano in 1975, uh, entitled The Philippines at the Spanish Contact. Uh, definitely, uh, Pigafetta observed cats and dogs in the Visayas, and they are not listed as items of trade, nor as objects of sacrifice or feasting. So uh, earlier then, at, at, at the very least in, in the Visayan region, so these cats and dogs were kept as as pets and not for for as sustenance or for nutrition. And there were also reports of swine, uh, possibly a a domesticated swine or, or, or pig that was presented to them as a gift from the chief of Butuan and the chief of Cebu. And goats were definitely uh, figured prominently in Pigafetta's account, where it was presented to Magellan uh, by the prince of Cebu and the chief of Mactan as, as a gift to them. All right, so additional uh, historical context here. So after uh, Pigafetta's uh, well, uh, Magellan, ill-fated Magellan Elcano circumnavigation, of course, uh, there were other um, explorations that went to the Philippines afterwards. So you have Rui Lopez de Villalobos in 18, uh, 1546, and then afterwards, uh, sometime in the 1560s, uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi also came in to the Philippines. So essentially the galleon trade, so this is where the, the galleon, galleon trade started after the fall of Manila in 1571. So afterwards, there was a galleon trade um, where in, uh, two, two trade ships uh, that plies the Manila and Acapulco route. So you know, maraming trades now from, from the produce coming from Mexico and from the produce coming from from the Philippines. And it was at this point that there was possible introduction of foreign livestock. So one, uh, this could be the sheep uh, and cattle and horses. But of course, sheep didn't, uh, uh, didn't survive because of the, the, the tropical climate of the Philippines. And there are some records that uh, would indicate that cattle and horses may have predated Spanish colonial period, but with little evidence. So this was coming from the paper uh, published by Noel Amano in 2021. And um, afterwards in the 1590, there was a publication, there was a manuscript that, that came out, the box, what is called the Boxer Codex, or also known as the, the Manila Manuscript. Uh, it was probably written under orders from the Spanish Governor General, Gomez Perez de las Marinas, as a tool to, um, uh, to make an inventory of all the, the lands that they have conquered, and Philippines is one of them. So essentially this Boxer Codex includes illustration of ethnic groups across Southeast Asia during Spanish contact. So uh, this includes Philippines, uh, some parts of, um, of Inter uh, Malaysia and Borneo. And it also includes illustrations of mythical creatures. As you can see here, uh, there are some creatures that uh, illustrations that resembles a snake, uh, some four-legged mammal with with a, with, a, with a cross of a bird, uh, and what have you. So yeah, there are mythical creatures and demons, and it also illustrates some uh, ethnic groups across the region. So you have here the native Visayan slaves, uh, and also some illustrations of Tagalog royalty. And from from the codex itself, there's also an illustration of a Sambal tribe hunting a water buffalo. But other than that, uh, although I haven't, uh, I, I really haven't um, got hold of the, the, the manuscript itself. So this is the only picture that I've came across or uh, illustration that, that shows a, a, a mammal, uh, a real mammal that's being uh, um, documented. And so here the, the, the butchering of a, a probably a water buffalo with that is a, uh, a feral population. Right, and then in 1668, uh, by by Francisco Alzina, there's a publication here, uh, Historia Natural de la Islas Bisaya, 
Okay, so it's published in 1668. So in one of the, the, the illustrations, uh, the plates there uh, show several, um, several wildlife that are found in the Philippines. And uh, some of these are mammals, as you can see here, uh, with, 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 the, with the, the text that is writ written on the plates. So you have this Colabnit Murcielago. Murcielago, of course, is your offshore bat. So Colabnit Murcielago Mediano, it's a, or a medium-sized bat shown here that's in flight. Cabog uh, Murcielago Grande, or big, uh, big-sized bat, probably your Acerodon or Teropus. Uh, the baboy, a uh, wild pig, and it's, since the, the publication is in Visaya, uh, in the Visayas region, could probably be the, the Susebifrons or the Visayan warty pig. And it also includes the Jabali Mestizo, so the hybrid, probably the hybrid wild pig. So even during that time, so there would have been a, a hybrid, probably either, probably intentional or, or happened in nature. So the, um, hybridization between a, a domesticated pig and a, a natural wild, wild pig. And then in 1686, um, actually from the accounts uh, of, from what is written uh, in the Land Mammals of the Philippines by Edward Taylor in 1934, uh, he, he said that among the earlier records of mammals is that of William Dampier who visited Mindanao in 1686. He remarked that uh, the hogs are ugly creatures, so this could probably be uh, pertain to your uh, Sus Philippensis or the Philippine warty pig. Uh, and then he continues, they have all great knobs growing over their eyes and there are multitude, multitudes of them in the woods. So we're talking here about natural populations so, uh, in the forest, so possibly pertaining to your Sus Philippens, Philippine, uh, Philippensis. So William Dampier is, a, is an English explorer and naturalist. He pub actually published uh, the accounts of his, uh, of his travels, uh, New Voyage Around the World. And it was actually um, uh, the first explorer to circumnavigate the world three times. So <clears throat> very, very unusual uh, feat during that time. And then in 1699, uh, there's a Jesuit missionary and naturalist by the name of George Josef Kamel. Uh, it's actually from the from the from Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, uh, and he gave the first comprehensive accounts of the Philippine flora and fauna, which is actually written in the Philosophical Transactions, written by Jacobo Petiver. And uh, in that manuscript, uh, he the, um, George Camille provided some illustrations of um, of at least two species of mammals. Uh, the one on the on the left here is uh, called Mustela. Um, it probably looks like a Paradoxurus or your Vivera or your, your mga civets or musang. But of course, um, he said, uh, George Camel in his, it's in his notes uh, indicated that it's Mustela. So the known Mustelids in the Philippines are your Palawan stink badger, which uh, based from the drawing, it doesn't really resemble that of your, your Palawan stink badger. And uh, I, I, I think, I believe that uh, it could probably resemble that of your of your civets. And he also, uh, George Camel also did an illustration on a tarsier as uh, shown here in this illustration. And he named it as Circopithecus Luzonis Minimus and erroneously listed it on Luzon Island. And uh, looking into comparing the, the illustration of George Camel with what, an, uh, what a tarsier looks like, uh, it appears to be very, very different uh, if you compare it from here. And uh, it, it resembles more closely with, with the, the long-tailed macaque uh, as shown here. So there could have probably been um, um, difference in, in, in what, what George Camille perceived of the, of, the, of the animal that we've seen, but uh, he listed the, the type locality of, uh, or at least where it was captured, as Luzon Island, as and of course, as we all know, uh, the Philippine tarsier is uh, only found on the Mindanao faunal region of Mindanao, Bohol, uh, um, Samar, and Leyte. So it was listed as on Luzon. So there could be possible, uh, possibly two, two identifications on this. So it's probably be a a tarsier, which was uh, erroneously listed on Luzon Island, or probably your your long-tailed macaque.
And then, of course, in 1758, when when uh, Carl von Linn or Carolus Linnaeus published the Systema Naturae, okay, so it's the tenth edition uh, uh, in 1758, and in that um, in that publication, so it only included uh, the Philippine Tarsier and the Philippine Flying Lemur as officially known for the Philippines. So Dalawa, there's only two species that are officially officially known for, for, for our country. And in that text in Sistema Nature indicated that uh, Simia Sericta, which was uh, the, the scientific name assigned to Tarshir back then, was found in Luzon, was, uh, listed in, found in Luzon. And the Lemur Volans, or the, the, which the, the old name of the, the, the Philippine flying lemur, was found in Pampanga. And of course, obviously, these are erroneous uh, uh, attribution of, your, of the locality, uh, which of course I've said, mentioned earlier that both species are only found in the Mindanao faunal region. And then of course, after uh, Carl von Linn's publication of the Systema Naturae, there were other scientists as well, or um, naturalists who also had listed uh, a list of mammals that were found in the Philippines. And both uh, Pieter Bodert in 1768 and Peter Palas in 1780 uh, listed Philippine flying lemur as present in the, in the Philippines. Okay, so we now go to, uh, so that's this, the, the 1521 to the, 18, uh, the 1799. So there's a period of more than 200 years of, of uh, during that time, but very, very minimal exploration, of course. So, so we now go to the 1800s. So I've separated this, uh, this portion into three. So 1820 to 1849, 1850 to 1879, and 1880 to 1898. Okay, so another historical context of the period. So during that time, okay, um, there were, uh, that period was um, marked by, your, uh, by the Bourbon reforms in Spain after the War of Spanish Secession, it was the mid 1700s. So essentially this bourbon reform uh, was to stimulate manufacturing technology in Spain and its colonies. So the colonies were from, of course, included the Philippines, Cuba, uh, much of Central and South America. So, and then uh, Philip V uh, was the first king from, from the house of bourbon, was the, was, the, <clears throat> was the monarch back then. So what happened here in the Philippines because of that bourbon reforms was that uh, it paved way for the establishment of the Royal Philippine Company in 1785. And what ha also happened here is that it opened the Philippines to international trade in, in 1834. Uh, back and during this time, the galleon trade was already abolished. So the galleon trade uh, operated between uh, the 1500s up to 1815, I think. And what happened because of the, uh, the establishment of the Royal Philippine Company, and then, of course, with the changes uh, in the reforms in, in back in Spain, so there, thereby caused larger exploitation of resources in the colonies, and of course, resulted to increased taxes. Essentially, the, these urban reforms contributed to a lot of the uh, the secession of several colonies from Spain. So, starting with uh, parts of Mexico, uh, uh, Argentina, yeah, Argentina, of course, and Philippines. And then, but of course, with the opening of the Philippines to international trade, also came in with, with several, so many explorers that went to the Philippines as well and did some natural history collections. So during the 1820, uh, to the period of 1820 to 1849, so this was marked first with, um, and during the period of 1822 to 1836, there were uh, four uh, naturalists who, who describe uh, Philippine ma uh, mammals from the Philippines, starting with, of course, with Anselm Demarest. Uh, he, he described uh, the Servus Marianus or Rusa Marianus, uh, although the type locality was in Marianas Island. So this is apparently um, what happened here is that the, the Philippine deer, Philippine brown deer was introduced to, the, to Guam and Marianas Island back in the, the late 1700s. And then during the explorations there, so they described, uh, they thought that the, the, the Servus Marianus 
was uh, native to, to those islands. So hence the name Servus Marianus. What actually happened, uh, it turns out that there were already some collections from Luzon back in 1820 of the, of the Philippine brown deer. So what's, what's, what's not, uh, well, there's now consensus that uh, Sir Philippine brown deer um, was introduced in the Marianas and then of course it's native to the Philippines. And then in 1831, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the largest uh, bat in the world, a certain jabatos or golden crown flying fox uh, was described uh, by Friedrich uh, Eschholz uh, with a type locality from Manila, Luzon Island. So a lot actually of, of type localities that was listed in the Philippines indicate Manila, which, which shows you that, uh, of course, Manila was heavily forested back then uh, and as opposed to what, what, what you see right now. And uh, in 1836 by Fortune Edo and Paul Gervais, uh, they both of them described uh, two insect eating bats from the Philippines. First is the, your Rhinolophus rufus or the large rufus horse, horseshoe bat, which is uh, coincidentally is the largest rhinolophid in the Philippines. So it's only found in the Philippines and the Philippine sheet tailed bat or your uh, Embalanura alecto. So, the, and the type locality listed for, for both of these species were from Manila, Luzon Island. And then in eight, between the years 1836 and 1840, so the name that is uh, very prominent during this period would be uh, Hugh Cumming. Uh, he's an English uh, collector. He's actually dubbed as the Prince of Collectors who collected the Philippines uh, back in uh, between 1836 to 1840. And a lot of those specimens were sent to the Zoological Society of London, including mammal specimens. Although most of the, the, the specimens that, that Hugh, Hugh Cumming uh, uh, collected were uh, mostly on plants and shells and very few on, on mammal specimens. And a lot of the, the mammal specimens that uh, Cumming brought with, uh, were described by George Waterhouse. And would probably uh, some of you uh, studying biodiversity would be probably familiar with some of the species that were named after Hugh Cumming. Of course, the southern giant cloud rat or the Floemis cumingai, and uh, there's a there's a bird, uh, Dasilophus cumingai, or the or yung mga malcoha, uh, crested or scale feathered malcoha, if I'm right. And then these the, the specimens that were brought in by by you coming were described by George Waterhouse between the years 1839 to 1845. So George Waterhouse is a curator of uh, the Zoological Society of London's museum. And he described eight new species from the from Hugh Cummings collection between 1839 to 45. So these include your flow Miss Cumming guy in 1839, Sundasayurus philippensis, uh, 1839 as well, and Rhinolophus philippinensis in 1839. And then uh, in 1843, he described its Ders pygmaeus, and then four species were described in 1845. You have your uh, Carivula pellucida, uh, Minopterus tristis, Myotis macrotarsus, and this very, very beautiful bat, uh, insect eating bat, Myotis fufopictus. And then we go now to 1850 to 1879. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, collectors during this period would be Fedor Yegor. Um, He's a German ethnologist, uh, naturalist, and explorer, and uh, he collected mainly for the Natural History Museum found in Berlin. And he visited several places in the Philippines, uh, Surigao del Norte, Samar, and many localities in the Bicol Peninsula. So this would include Albay, Paracale, um, uh, even well, some parts of Camarines Norte and Camarines Sur. And there were several species, uh, at least two species that were named, a mammal species that were named after Feder Yegor. So this include the Philippine musky fruit bat or your Tinochirus jagori, and the common common trumpet trumpet eared bat or Phoniscus jagori. So this Phoniscus jagori is a very very least uh, we we know very very little about this this very very beautiful bat. Actually, I found this in Mount Makiling, and one of the distinct features of this this uh, of this bat is the salt and pepper look on its on its pelage. So you have this. Uh, gold and, and black and white uh, 
uh, colors in, 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 in its hairs. And then a lot of the, 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 the specimens that brought in by, by Feder Jaeger was described by Willem Peters uh, during between the years 1866 and 1871. So he's a curator at the Berlin Zoological Museum and he, he worked mainly on bats describing at least six species from the Philippines. As mentioned earlier, you already have Phoniscus jaguari in 1866, Kinochirus jagora in 1861. And he also um, described Rhinolophus arcuatus in 1871, and then uh, three Hypocidarid species. You have this uh, Hypocidarus obscurus and Hypocidarus antricula, which was aether during that time, Hypocidarus aether. And then you have uh, also described Hypocidarus coronatus uh, in 1871. And it was previously for the longest time, it's known only from the type specimen uh, and which was collected in Lake Mainit in Surigao del Sur. Or, or Agusan del Norte, I'm not sure. But we rediscovered it in 2009 in Polillo Island. So after 130, 38 years of being obscure and uh, no other information uh, associated with it, uh, we rediscovered it in Polillo Island. And eventually it was also found in on Bohol Island as well. Okay, and then, um, between the years 1853, okay, um, and, and in 1871, uh, Conrad Temnick uh, is a Dutch zoologist. Um, so actually the first director of the National Museum of Natural uh, History in Leiden. So he described the mottled winged flying fox in 1853 or your Desmalopix uh, leucopterus. So previously it was known as Theropus leucopterus, leucopterus but uh, changes uh, done by Chris Helgen of the United States National Museum would show that this definitely a, a separate genus. And then um, in 1871, Philip Sclater, uh, an English zoologist, uh, also described the Visayan spotted deer or your service Alfredi. So Philip Sclater, um, well, he proposed the six uh, geographical regions uh, of the world in 1858 and also included, um, hypothesized the presence of a sunken continent between Madagascar and India, known as your Lemuria. So major controversial during that time. And of course, it was also already debunked uh, with the, the, uh, the plate tectonics theory by, by Alfred Wegener. And uh, Phil Sclater is also the founder and editor of your, uh, a very high impact journal, the IBIS. And then in 18, between the years 1877 and 1879, so there were two uh, um, collector, um, yeah, a tandem, uh, there's a tandem of a collector and a, a zoologist by the name of Alfred Everett and Albert Gunter. So Alfred Everett was an English bureaucrat and a naturalist. So uh, he mainly worked in Borneo as, a, as, a, as an administrator. And he collected for, for the Marquess of Tudale and Walter Rothschild. And some of these collect, collections ended up in the British collection, uh, British Museum. And this was described by Albert Gunter. Uh, he's just a German English uh, zoologist. And um, several of these, uh, at least three of these species were described, uh, including Rattus Everti uh, in 1879. And you also have Hystrix pumila or your um, uh, Palawan porcupine. And then you have the Sundasayurus teri, or uh, <clears throat> uh, a squirrel that is found in, I think in Balabak Island, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then there are also one species, of course, uh, another species that was named after Alfred Everett, uh, the Eurogale Everetti uh, by Thomas in 1888, or your Philippine uh, tree shrew. Okay, so after that, uh, we now go to the period between 1880 and 1889, which I will call the decade of the large mammals. So during this time uh, in 1886, Alfred Nering, who was a German zoologist and paleontologist, uh, described the Philippine water pig as you know, Solu, uh, Sus celebensis philippinensis. And the type locality was uh, in Luzon Island. And and 
subsequently, well, after that, there were also other um, uh, individuals of Philippine Warpy Pig that was described. Uh, first would be uh, uh, synonyms, sexual disorder synonyms. Uh, first would be your Sus Marche by Hewitt in 1888, uh, type localities in Laguna. And then uh, there are also three different uh, synonyms as well. Uh, Sus Ephrenus, Sus Microtis, and Sus Frenatus, but described by Hugh in, 1980, yeah, in 1888, also in Laguna province. So it's very, very uh, bizarre you know, uh, uh, showing that there are four different species of <clears throat> four different uh, well, four different species of, of warty pigs that are found within Laguna. Actually, uh, you would describe at least uh, 40 different species of, of deers and, and warty pigs uh, in the Philippines. And some of them found within 100 kilometer radius in, in Manila. So a lot of those are definitely synonyms. And then of course, in 1897, uh, Major described a uh, uh, warty pig from Mindanao, Sus Mindanensis. And these are, were uh, classified or treated as synonyms, synonyms of Sus uh, Philippensis. And then in 1887 and in 1888, so Huet described uh, the Falawan stink badger, uh, the Medaos Marche. And then in 1888, also Huet described uh, the Palawan birded pig, uh, Sus Hanobarbus. Uh, and um, there's a synonym, um, Sus Barbatus Palavanensis. So, but previously it was um, classified as Sus barbatus, but then uh, the Ahenobarbus was, uh, was elevated to full species level. And then in, uh, in 1888, so I mentioned this before, uh, Pierre Marie Hude uh, is a French Jesuit missionary and a zoologist. So I mentioned before that he described at least 40 species of, of deer and, and wild pigs from the Philippines. Pero meron at least don uh, from that. A uh, high number of, of described species, which eventually turn out to become synonyms, uh, two actually passed muster. And what, two of these, uh, the, the Babalus mindarensis, which is described in 1888, and, and of course, Sue Sebe uh, in 1888 as well. Uh, on the other hand, there's a bit of controversy surrounding the, the description of the Babalus mindarensis. Uh, Joseph B. Steer. Uh, actually publish um, a description of the, the, the Tamarau as Noah Mindarensis in the August of 1888. Uh, uh, Pierre-Marie Hude also described um, the, the Tamarau in 1888, but the exact publication date is unknown. But on the other hand, uh, the description, the author of the species is largely attributed to, to Pierre-Marie Hude. And then in the, the last period of, uh, of the, the Spanish uh, colonization uh, between 1890 to 1898, uh, there were also this, uh, this, this era uh, was, we saw here the description of two uh, species of cloud rats. Uh, first would be your Floemis pallidus by, by Nering in 1890, or the Northern Luzon giant cloud rat. So it's, it's here. The actual size of the, the northern Luzon giant cloud rat. I have to uh, attribute this uh, credit, uh, this photograph from Julie Barcelona, um, a botanist and my good friend. And uh, Mayer in 1895 described Craterhomus uh, Schadenbergi or the Luzon bushy tailed cloud rat. Um, the, the type locality was in Mount Data, but our visit there back in 2006, uh, 2005. Uh, interviews with, with, with several people there um, uh, would indicate that's already locally extinct. But it's also, but, but this, spec this specimen, uh, I think Larry uh, and company uh, trapped this in Mount Pulag. Uh, we also actually uh, uh, documented the, the, the Luzon tailed cloud rat in Mount Amuyao in uh, near uh, Bontoc. And then you also had the Minaj scientific expedition in the 1890s. So this was largely financed by Louis Minaj of, uh, in, of Minnesota. 
So the expedition was led by Frank Borns and Dean Worcester in September of 1890. So Dean Worcester was a, was a known administrator back here uh, during the, the American period, uh, the start of the American period in 1900s. Um, he was the head of uh, Bureau of Science in Manila, and I think he founded the, uh, the PGH or Philippine General Hospital. So during the Minaj scientific expedition, so they collected for 29 months. So they visited 19 islands. So not just in the Philippines, but I think they, they also explored and went to Borneo, uh, Singapore, some parts of Indonesia. But a lot of the localities they visited were from the Philippines. So, <clears throat> so in Palawan, in Calamianes, Mindoro, uh, Romblon, Sibuyan and Tablas, uh, Leyte, Panay, uh, Gibaras, Negros, uh, Cebu and Siquijor, and uh, within um, the Sulu archipelago, and definitely across uh, Mindanao. So a lot of the collections they did were on, on birds, and some there were some plants. But more than 500 mammal specimens were actually uh, collected as well. And they were deposited mainly at the Mel Museum at Minnesota and at the Field Museum in, in Chicago. And um, most of the collections that were, were from this expedition, mammal specimens, were mostly large mammals. So you have tamarau, uh, warty pigs, uh, flying foxes, and slow loris. So not many of the small ones, uh, especially on bats, uh, oh, squirrels definitely, um, were, were very, very few. <clears throat> and then during this period as well, um, where when, when Castro de Elera was the director of the University of Santo Tomas Museum. And uh, among, among um, mammalogists, uh, ornithologists, herpetologists, uh, would definitely know of the Castro Elera collection uh, at USD, which is also off limits to, to visitors and, 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 and other people who would like to study uh, the natural history collection at, uh, at USD. So it's, it has sort of become a holy grail among us um, wildlife biologists. So the, the, the USD Museum was established in 1869. And then, uh, well, some of them, uh, yeah, uh, dates back 1869. And then as you can see in the collections here, um, and some of them, uh, and then it, uh, it, it was transferred to the Sampaloc campus in 1936. And then, uh, Castro de Alero was the director during that time. And uh, from his work, uh, the contribution at the Fauna Filipina by, by Castro de Alero. And this was written at the, uh, two years after his death. Uh, there was a, I uh, forgot the name who wrote it uh, for him. And based from the, from the pictures, of course, I cannot, uh, I, I've seen the, the PDF of, the, of the, 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 the text. And of course I can't, I can't read Spanish, but based on the plates that were, that were, that were, that were uh, with the PDF. So I've counted at least 25 species of mammals uh, that were housed in, in the, in the USD uh, museum. So this include um, the tamarau and um, uh, the cyan spotted deer. And you also have several uh, small species of bats. So you have rhinolophus, you have megaderma, and you also have hypocidaris pygmaeus. And it would be very, very interesting, you know, um, of course, these are your mounted specimens. Uh, definitely, there will be uh, some specimens as well that are kept as as museum specimens or study skins. So it'd be very, very interesting to 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 learn um, what are what are the what are the species that are housed at the museum. Of course, some of them uh, might have um, outdated uh, taxonomy as well. Of course, with the with the changing uh, names over the past several years. So it'd be very, very worthwhile, not only to examine the specimens, but of course, um, to, to, to make some, some, some changes in, in, the, in the nomenclature of the, or identification of, of the specimens there. And then of course, uh, the, the period between uh, this last period towards the Philippine independence is highlighted uh, with a, with a dynamic duo of Oldfield Thomas and John Whitehead uh, in, in the publication of Oldfield Thomas uh, in the Transactions of the Zoological Society of London in 1898. Uh, he said, 
Mr. Whitehead has made a most wonderful and unexpected discovery. Because prior to that, uh, in the 1880s, well, uh, actually Alfred Russell Wallace uh, uh, made a comment on the, the, the fauna of the Philippines that uh, the Philippine fauna is unremarkable, at least on the mammals, uh, except for Floemis kumingai, which the, the genus is only found in the Philippines, all the other species that are found or all other genera that are found in the Philippines are shared with, uh, with the rest of the Indo-Malayan region for, for uh, with Indonesia and Malaysia. So, so it came as a surprise when John Whitehead delivered fresh batch of specimens to the British Museum and Oldfield Thomas, who was the leading uh, small mammal expert in the world during that time, uh, looked into the batch of specimens and was surprised to see several uh, specimens that were, uh, doesn't fit with the known uh, species or genera of what is known of genera at the time. So he described at least one, two, three, six uh, endemic genera or new genera. Uh, you have the Crotomies, uh, Selenomies, which eventually subsume under Crotomies. Uh, you have rhynchomies here uh, with the very, very elongated uh, snout. Uh, Batomies, uh, members of the, the arboreal clade. Uh, Chronomies, very small. This was captured in, in Isabella uh, in 1894, I think. Um, actually, this, this is a very small rat, Chronomies, um, probably less than six inches in length or uh, including the tail. And apparently John Whitehead in his observations and his notes um, used an air gun to, 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 to capture this. So this will show that uh, John Whitehead was a very, very good shot uh, during that time. And of course, it also includes uh, Carpomies, um, those members of the arboreal clade. And little would uh, old Phil Thomas uh, realize that some of these, uh, well, the, these endemic rodent, endemic genera of rodents uh, are members of this, um, a very unique clade of, of rodents that uh, underwent explosive radiation in the Philippines. So you have this vermivore clade uh, represented by your four genera with more than 30 species. So vermivore clade, so these are your archbaldomies, uh, apomies that day, uh, rhynchomies cericoides, crotomies white head eye. This would uh, feed on, on on earthworms, uh, so and they're found mostly on high elevations, and some of these uh, rodents that originally Oldfield Thomas described are members of the arboreal clade, represented by your five genera, uh, with seventeen species, uh, with your Craterobus shadenbergi, Carpomis feurus, uh, Batomis grantii, and Phloemis pallidus, and of course the recent uh, member of this arboreal clade. Uh, Maseromus Golantang, uh, which was discovered by, which was captured by, by Danny Balete in Mount Banahaw and described by Hine et al. in 2009. So this very, very small uh, our, um, cloud rat family, uh, a member of a cloud rat uh, clade, um, it's about 15 grams as opposed to, you have this crater room, shade and bird guy and so in guy that would weigh more than a kilo. So, the, 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 the forms that have been assumed are by this arboreal clade is very, very spectacular. So, so you have this uh, wide magnitude and the, the difference between the sizes themselves. And then uh, there were also other mammal species described by Old Field Thomas, uh, including um, the, the Balabak uh, mouse deer or your Tragulus nigricans in 1892. So this was collected during the J.B. Steer uh, expedition. Uh, Hylopetes nigropes in 1893, or your <clears throat> Palawan flying squirrel. Uh, this is part of the, the Alfred Everett uh, expedition. And then you have your Harpionicterus whitehead eye in 1896, uh, collected by, by John Whitehead. And then I mentioned this before, uh, Eurogale Everett eye, um, collected by Everett as well. And then uh, your Topaya Palawanensis or the Palawan tree shrew in 1894. Um, just a note on John Whitehead. So he collected heavily between 
early 1890 to 1895 in the Philippines. And then he also went to other places across Southeast Asia. And unfortunately, he met his death in, in Hainan Island in, I think, in 1899 um, due to fever, probably malaria during that time. But of course, the, the legacy that uh, John White had left behind, uh, the number of collections, of course, uh, was uh, became the, the, the reason why the Philippines was uh, put into a map or was put into uh, not recognizing the Philippines as a, as a center of, of, of diversity, especially for, for murid rodents. So to, to summarize uh, the talk here, um, as you can see here, uh, what I call the great mammalian discoveries. So as you can see in the graph, um, all in all, during that period of uh, Spanish uh, colonization, there were about 81 species that were at least or described or known. Uh, that the whole Philippine mammal fauna, as, as it stands right now, is about 214 species. So uh, less than half of the, the, the species that we know today were, were described uh, during the Spanish colonial period. And then in, in uh, 51 species of those, of the 81 species uh, have Philippines as the type locality. And as you can see in the, in the, in the trajectory or, or, or um, the amount of, of, of species that were added or known for the Philippines, of course, when it started in 1758, officially with, with uh, uh, Linnaeus um, list uh, in the Sistema Naturae with only two species. So, after 1820, in the mid 1830s, it skyrocketed with 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 coming and Waterhouse. So essentially, what, what we're seeing here with the with the with the the massive increase in the number of species that are known for the Philippines was due to what I called your dynamic duos. So you have uh, during the part of the, the mid 1830s, you have you coming and oops, sorry, uh, you coming and George Waterhouse. So they describe or documented the presence of at least 25 species uh, during that time. And then you have the, the, the combination or the partnership between Feder Yegor and William Peters uh, in, the, in the early 1850s with eight species. So there were also some expeditions in between. So you have uh, Alfred Everett. So you have Joseph Steer and of course the Menage expedition uh, written by Borns and Worcester. Of course, they, 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 they added very, very few, no number of species for the Philippines. But of course, the end of the period was highlighted by the partnership of John Whitehead and Ophel Thomas, where they described, um, well, well, well where, where Thomas described 15 species uh, in, in eight genera, uh, including other species, uh, non murid species. And of course, this uh, brought the Philippines uh, into you know became known as uh, one of the, the the centers of of origin and diversity for for murid rodents. So this ends my talk. So I dedicate this this talk to my my mentor Danilo S. Balete, who prematurely died in 2017. Uh, he's a world class mammalogist, uh, as Emerson C. would say, one of the finest naturalists the country has ever produced, and he's also my friend. Rami salamat po. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, Sir Philip. <laughs> wow, that was a wonderful yeah. and informative <laughs> talk. It's so informative. <laughs> I think you have to publish it. Good. Kahit pa, kahit sa gasi, Derman. Pero ang dami, madami material. But I think you have to publish it. It's it's really very comprehensive and very <laughs> informative. Maraming salamat po, ma'am. Maraming salamat po, ma'am. Okay. Parang ang dami kong tanong. Anyway, let us now have our open forum to our audience here in Zoom. Please use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. To those who are watching via YouTube Live, leave your questions in the comments box and our technical assistant will copy it to Zoom. And Sir Philip and Mom Jude will try to answer as many questions as possible given the time allotted. So may questions na po ba tayo? Ako na lang muna, Sir Philip. Sure. Of course, ma'am. So ang ganda nung iyong uh, pin-resent from... Uh, so Linnaeus was only able to 
published two ano Limer Volans and then Simia Sericta. And then the 1800s was really the time or an important period for mammal discoveries in the Philippines by the Europeans. And I was expecting that they would first be able to uh, describe the large mammals, but unexpectedly, yung large mammals was in the late 1880s, yes. ano? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you have an idea or can you tell us something about their collection methods? Right, ma'am. Uh, during the time of you coming, uh, so mag magdadaang sila yung coming yung kanilang ships uh, at the port. So what usually they would do is uh, they would contract yung mga, mga taga doon, mga, 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 mga the natives, and including children. So they would scour the, the whole countryside uh, looking for 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 mammals. So that that's what uh, you coming did. So essentially you coming just just stayed in the in the boat or in the in the, in the, in the, in the port. But I'm not sure if they use guns during that time. Uh, even with Fedor Yegor and with with um, with Willem Peters, so uh, they were interested in in mainly in bats. So not really too many of the of your for large mammals. Of course, Cynocephalus volans, um, uh, large flying fox, golden crown flying fox, were already part of the the the, the collection by that during that time. But uh, for for Mindoro, uh, for 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 Tamarau, those swarthy pigs. Uh, uh, surprisingly, I, I, and I don't actually know what the answer to this. Uh, surprisingly, during those uh, 1820, 1830s to 1870s, uh, there there weren't really any uh, material uh, for 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 large mammals. Only until the the, the 1870 to 1880s nga lang that, that they. They, they 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 describe uh, uh, these uh, you know, for the tamara the, the the deer and yung mga wild pigs. Uh, I'm not so sure, ma'am. What 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 what's the what was used? So, but definitely during 1880s and 1890s, they were already using guns during that time, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so very very have... surprising. Yeah, you're 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 absolutely right, ma'am. Bakit late na <laughs> during that period? Okay, so we have questions already from our audience. And uh, from an anonymous attendee, have there also been historical accounts or publications which can pinpoint when and how invasive rodents arrived in the Philippines? Right, ma'am. Uh, well, definitely during the Spanish colonial period, uh, these invasive rodents, some of them at least, were already there. Uh, there were no indications that, um, so probably during the, the galleon trade, there were uh, uh, there were already exchanges, not only with goods, but with, with fauna as well, of course, with, the, with your invasive rodents. But uh, there, it didn't really, looking into the accounts from the early accounts from 1500s, from Alzina, even the, uh, to Pigafetta, to, to, to uh, Maramipa, you know, you know, I didn't actually list that. So they didn't uh, include yung mga invasive rodents during that time. But of course, uh, fossil records would indicate that they were already present uh, as early as 6,000 BC. So, there are mga fossil records of these invasive rodents, uh, Rattus excellens, Rattus tanizomi. So, it probably came in with with a continuous wave of human colonization, human diaspora in, from Southeast Asia going to the Philippines. So it probably came in with that, and of course, the other direction from. Uh, from the Polynesian, from Micronesia, so so during that time, so it was they were already there at least. Uh, uh, Rattus excellens, Rattus tanizumi, probably Rattus net netidus and tumanicus. I'm not sure with Rattus norvegicus. Uh, probably a recent uh, introduction during during the, the uh, probably during the Galleon trade, but several of those other other invasive rodents uh, they. Def, most probably predated Spanish colonial period. No? But uh, you pinpoint uh, fossil records. Lang po yun. And the work by Janine Ochoa, uh, Philip Piper, uh, Armand Mijares would also show that there were already presence of uh, invasive rodents back then. Okay, we have a question uh, from Brian Paul Valmonte. 
are all warty pigs are all described warty pigs edible oh yes <laughs> oh yes ma'am i mean um uh, if I, mean, I had experience. but we don't encourage them to eat no we don't it, no, 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 definitely ma'am definitely not not, not ma'am of course uh sana hindi ako nang hindi na i've uh in my 20 more than 20 years of experience i've uh tasted uh uh warty pig meat uh, mga ganun. pero hindi kami nag hunting so ganun, binigay lang sa amin but of course uh, there have been uh indications of hybridization back then uh by by the accounts of Francisco Alsina uh there was this haboli mestizo so probably a uh, mestizo even meaning parang hybrid ng ng wild population of wild pig uh populations of warty pigs and your domesticated pigs as well so uh, and of course, this has been ano, uh, eaten, uh, kinakain naman siya. And of course, uh, uh, there are so many tr- uh, tribes across the Philippines uh, predating the, the Spanish colonial period who have already, uh, you know, hunting uh, wild pigs as well. Okay, thank you. And from Angelico Tiongson, thank you for the very fascinating presentation. I wonder in your archival research, did you come across any mention of the aquatic mammals? Although, of course, your focus here is yes. on terrestrial mammals. There, uh, although yung hindi ko na pinansin, <laughs> I mean, uh, hindi ko na pinansin yung, ano, uh, yung mga accounts on, on, on marine mammals. Of course, there were uh, already specimens even back then. Uh, yung dugong, I think uh, it was listed uh, back in 1800. So may mga collections na rin. Uh, definitely from you coming, uh, the Everett, Alfred Everett collection. So there were already dugongs. And during the Menage expedition in 1890, so there mga, mga collections of, of dugongs back then. But uh, for whales and dolphins, I'm not so sure. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. For, uh, from Che 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 Sen Lim, what role did local people play? or what role may have the local people played in the scientific collecting of mammals during the Spanish colonial period? I think you mentioned a little about this. Yes, uh, it's mostly labor, at least. Uh, I do not see in any of the, the collections, uh, at least in the museum catalogs, mga online databases from publications that I've seen, I never seen any uh, Filipino <laughs> authors, at the very least, kasama sila as authors, or even as uh, official collector, so essentially as labor. But uh, so this changed a bit at the turn of the 20th century. So si Celestino uh, was collecting for Bureau of Science Manila. He's working with uh, Edward Taylor, I think, during that time, or uh, Edgar Mearns. Uh, he was listed prominently as you know as a collector uh, of several mammal species, but. During the Spanish colonial period, uh, I think to my to my to my best of knowledge, uh, walang walang mention of uh, of Filipino uh, collectors at all. So this only changed uh, after the during the American period. Walang record no? Well, wala po eh. well definitely authors, uh, descriptors, wala talaga official ano. So it's a labor mamangyari. Uh, Okay, thank you. From Darwin Ganado, from Bataan, di ba? Si Darwin. Tanong ko lang din po regarding sa photos sa Boxer Codex, yun po sa Zambal Slaves, yung water buffalo po ba doon ay native species natin or katulad ng sa Tamaraw? Thanks. Uh, we cannot know for sure if it's actually a parang Tamaraw or yung dwarf Tamaraw. Although, uh, there have been fossil records of Bubalos, uh, Tamarau, like uh, in other places, of course, in Cebu, and if I'm not mistaken, in in Cagayan, in Calauque, I'm not so sure, but definitely in Cebu. So they, they, they're thinking uh, Janine, uh, yeah. Philip Piper, Sila, Sila Larin, but, uh, are thinking that uh, the Tamarau, or at least mga Bubalos, are widely distributed across the Philippines prior to their extinction. And of course, yung, yung Bubalos Mindorensis na lang known survival. So a surviving member of the genus. But yung Duso Boxer Codex, uh, Duso Sambal, of course, in Duso Balis, uh, Bataan Peninsula, I am not so sure. Uh, of course, there are already fossil records of carabaos or uh, yung mga buffaloes <coughs> present in the Philippines. 
uh, marami na po yan. And uh, uh, even before the Spanish colonial period, uh, Carabaos were already here in the Philippines. So may mga feral population. Uh, and some of them, um, they were brought during the migration you know, from from Bohol, uh, from from Borneo to the Philippines, so they brought uh, carabaos with them as well. And some of them, uh, some populations of carabao became feral, or became wild. So, but uh, on the other hand, of course, in the Boxer Codex or the Manila Manuscript, it's written in Spanish, and I can't understand Spanish. <laughs> and doing my MA literature search, uh, there wasn't any any in the literature would indicate that. The the, the 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 carabao that was slaughtered by the sambals in the in the illustration would suggest it's a it's a native uh, 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 native bobalus. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, were the collections uh, only for collecting itself, or did they collect it for some experiment? Now. Oh, uh, no, no, not for no. experiment. Oh, parang, <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't of that sort. So, of course, uh, it started uh, not only with the museum. There was this parang frenzy or very high interest among the richest mga royalties, uh, mga landed gentry across Europe for sila mga curious or collections. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the rich people, sila Rothschild, sila Marquette Tudel, Marquess Tudel. So, in their own private collection, they would... Uh, contract in mga collectors, naturalists to, to, to scour the whole world for these uh, for these birds and mammals and what have you. So essentially for, for, for collecting purposes and then eventually it became a you know, scientific endeavor, definitely. Uh, of course with, with the Benaj expedition, uh, with, uh, with with the coming Hugh, Hugh coming collection and then uh, K. Oldfield Thomas and John Whitehead. So and a lot of these collectors, ito yung kanilang yung parang uh, ano ito, uh, occupation and the source of income nila. They would sell this these uh, these collections to, to museums and and royalties across Europe. But uh, to be used as experiments, no, it wasn't actually of that sort back then. Uh, and some some of them were brought in live as in zoos uh, mm -hmm. for, for 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 expositions. So, mga trade fairs in Madrid, uh, you know, din sila ata ng, ng tamaraw in the, the, the trade fair in Madrid. Definitely in Chicago during the trade fair there, nagdala rin sila ng mga ano, ng mga wild mammals, live mammals. Okay, thank you. From an anonymous attendee also, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation on Philippine mammals, Sir Philip. Just want to humbly ask, are there rare species of mammals that have gone for years and not yet rediscovered despite several field expeditions and research. Right. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, of course, first would be your uh, Hippocydaris coronatus, which was described ah, yeah. in 1871. And then after more than 130 years, now rediscovered in 2009, we did in in Polillo and Bohol with, with Jody Sedlock. Uh, there were also some species, uh, although re relatively recently described. For example, the Eileen cloud rat. I think it was described in 1962, I think, or 1961. Uh, it's known only from the type specimen. So well, we have to know that Eileen is a very, very small island off the eastern, southern eastern coast of Mindoro. Napakaliit. Uh, and then there's a specimen that came from there, and then it hasn't been found. Hasn't been found ever since. So you uh, know, Crateromys australis from Dinagat Island. I think this was described in 1971 by Rabor. I'm not so sure. Uh, we thought it was extinct, and then it was rediscovered mga three years ago yata. There was a carcass and a video. Uh, but from the Spanish colonial period, uh, I am not so sure. The, 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 the main candidate would be your Gliscrophus typus. Uh, this is a species of insect eating bat. Uh, it was described back in Kasame uh, and described the, well, uh, the record of Waterhouse in the 1830s. Uh, 
um, we don't know what it looks. We don't. We haven't yet found it ever since in the Philippines. So more than 150 years now, and we don't know what it looks like. Uh, it's that the, the specimen is from Palawan, but other than that, we, we haven't captured it ever since. Okay, thank you. From an anonymous attendee, for Sir Philip Mamjud, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Are there still plenty of mammals to discover in the Philippines? How many percent and which part of the country needs to be assessed or be, re, uh, or be inventoried further? Uh, of course, there are definitely places in, in Luzon that, that, you know, uh, some of them relatively kokonti pa lang ating alam or uh, na survey pa lang very very few times of course cordillera uh, of course with, with uh, the work of Larry Heaney and Danny Ballet and Eric Rickard but there are also parts of, of the cordillera especially at the northern part uh, yung sa Kalinga or the uh, Payao uh, close to to Ilocos Norte so we don't know what's found in them uh, there are also parts of the Sierra Madre that we also do not know, uh, particularly the southern part uh, across Mauban, going down to almost to, to, to Bico province. Uh, Mindoro, but recently uh, by the works of uh, Larry Heaney and Danilo Balete, so they found four uh, species of apomies that got an in situ diversification within that island. So it has been uh, very, very spectacular diversification within that island. So, and then of course, Jake Esselstyn in 2010 um, discovered yung Stylocinium. It's a very relatively large bat in Mindoro back in 2010. And we don't know if kung baka meron pa mga ibang mga, mga large flying, oh, mga, mga large mammals that remains to be discovered. Uh, Palawan would be a, another prime candidate. But what, what we're seeing right now is yung discovery of new species. Uh, aside from yung mga arboreal, uh, yung masaromis gulantang, uh, because uh, arboreal trapping is really not a, a well-explored uh, avenue of research. Uh, of course, uh, kayo mam, uh, mampaw, kayo nila Sir Jason, nila good, did some uh, very important work on arboreal okay. wildlife in Mount Makili as well. But uh, of course, this has only been done in Mount Makili and other parts of Luzon. If this can be duplicated as well in Mindanao uh, with your squirrels and what have you, uh, another set of, of assemblage of mammals that are found there, uh, I'm sure that there will be some, some species that are found in, 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 in Mindanao. And uh, what's also interesting is that uh, how does one equivalent yung arboreal clade the mga cloud that's from Luzon, wala silang equivalent with in Mindanao, halos. well, you have the squirrels, but squirrels are relatively smaller compared to cloud rats. You don't have that in Panay, uh, you have, don't have that in Negros. And I will not be surprised if you can also find some lineage of arboreal rat rodents on these islands as well. So, and then, of course, uh, like I said, the species discoveries, what we're looking right now is the species complexes. So, dun yung talaga medyo high chances of discovering new species. So yung mga dating mga, mga species na, let's say, Rhinolophus arcuatus na uh, marami siyang mga subspecies, uh, iba't iba yung mga tsura niya uh, bit for every ice age island. So with the advent of uh, whole genome sequencing, mga molecular techniques, it might prove that for each uh, ice age island like Luzon or Panay or Mindanao, you will also have this endemic um, endemic species of mammals that were once thought to be just one species or super species. So ngayon magkakaroon na ng parang yung mga subspecies ay may elevate na into full species status. Okay, thank you. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, given the trend of discovery and description of mammals in the Philippines during the Spanish colonial period, how will you compare it with the current trend in the country, yeah. 1990 to present? 1990. Pero I mentioned ko na rin yung mga during the time of the American period. Uh, a lot of this, ma, mas lumaki din yung number of mammals that were 
that were documented or attributed to the Philippines. Of course, uh, with the work of Nude Anderson, so in over how whole new, what are the bats that are known for the Philippines? So, and dami mga genus, gender, and an ad. Edgar Mearns in 1905 added a lot of species of rodents in the Philippines as well. Jarrett Miller. And of course, with the work of the, the mighty triumvirate of Larry Heaney, uh, Danny Balete, and uh, Eric Rickard. I was looking at um, sa Wikipedia entry ni Danny. Wow, may Wikipedia ka na parts. <laughs> uh, Wikipedia entry ni Danny. I think he uh, described or co-described at least 15 species of mammals, 15 or 20 species of mammals. So we have uh, seven this Apomus and five with the Cerecomys and Archboldomys, may lima pa sa, sa Maseromys, may bat Batomys. So uh, with the paper by Larry Heaney, uh, in Dob Doubling Diversity, uh, si Mampa was the, the, the reviewer, but during that time, Journal of Biogeography. Geogra so uh, the, 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 the number of, of the mammals that were discovered uh, during the 1990s, talagang dramatic yung pagtaas. I think it exceeded what happened during kay Oldfield Thomas and John Whitehead. Mas mataas pa. And then, of course, they focused on this group of mammals, yung mga murids. So we're now seeing na talagang nagkaroon talagang explosive radiation in the Philippines and then ang um, dami talagang mga bagong species na pwede pa lumabas. And then looking into the 1998 synopsis of Philippine mammals, may mga entry doon si, si Larry and Danny na Apomis AC, which is found in Negros, Apomis D, which is found in Sibuyan, mga hindi pa sila described eh, up to now. So, um, but yeah, so yung, 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 yung level of species discovery during the 1990s would dwarf, hindi man dwarf, would exceed talaga yung mga nagawa nung, nung Spanish colonial period. And what is great here is that Filipinos were involved, really, really involved. I myself was a product of that, uh, uh, of that uh, collaboration with, uh, uh, with the mentorship of Danny and Larry and Eric by, during that time. And of course, si Mam Pao then, definitely. Uh, a lot of the, 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 the faculty here in, in UP Los Baños were, were the product of that uh, collaboration. Okay, thank you. From uh, related to that, from Dr. Leti Afuang, congratulations for the thorough and detailed account on the Philippine mammals. What is the peak of mammal description and discovery in the last 500 years? When did the Filipinos significantly contribute? So, so ma'am, yung, yung pinersent ko po kanina is parang 300, less than 400 years. So from 1521 to 1898, so that's 370 plus years. So I uh, sinadya ko pong not to add yung ano, uh, the American period probably for the, for the next talk siguro kung meron kasi sobrang dami na. <laughs> but I didn't add that. But during that Spanish colonial period, I would guess the yung nag, nag peak would be uh, yung sinabi ko nga po, yung uh, mga dynamic duos of that time. So you coming, the partnership of you coming and and George Waterhouse was very, very productive. Dami species na nakita, around 25 species. Uh, Feder Yegor and uh, Willem Peters were also productive back then. And then, of course, with, with uh, Oldfield Thomas and John Whitehead, so which resulted in discovery of at least eight genera na, that are very uh, restricted to the, to the Philippines. But uh, going back, uh, sorry. So going back, so. Of course, what I said previously, uh, the achievements during the Spanish colonial period was, I would think that were eclipsed uh, in, the, in the 20th century. And especially, nagsimula uh, yung participation of the Filipinos, of course, with Jascoro S. Rabor. Uh, he described several species of mammals, uh, the Psonia chapmanai, uh, yung bareback fruit bat in, in, in I think, uh, Negros at Antype locality. He described it in 1952. Kasama rin yung Procedura Negrina, uh, which is 1950s then, so, so of course in Negros. Uh, Angel Alcala, I'm not sure if, no, he did not describe any mammal. Uh, he did not describe any mammal. But after kay, uh, Dr. Rabor, 
uh, it was well, Pete Gonzalez was also there, uh, was uh, the head of the zoology department at the uh, Philippine National Museum. He also participated in several of the descriptions, uh, particularly uh, Archboldemis uh, Luzonensis uh, Isarog and Rincomis uh, Isarogensis in Mount Isarog. So he was uh, one of the co-authors. Si Manong Blas Tabaranza, who's based now in, on, in Australia, uh, also contributed uh, substantially to mga descriptions of mga Batomis uh, from Dinagat Isle, uh, Batomis Rosatus, uh, Chronomis Melanius in Mindanao. So there were a lot of species. And then, of course, uh, Danny Balete, definitely. Uh, what's what's uh, very unique about Danny is uh, he was not a co-author. He was not, also not a co-author, but the main author. Uh, so he was um, that, the uh, yung parang thing ko is uh, yung pinaka magaling na mamadjis talaga na uh, of, 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 of all time sa tingin ko. So, so a lot of us, you know, mamalis si si, si Aloy Duya, ako si Lalis Duya, si Lalis Duya. Uh, uh, we're only co-authors, of course. But uh, yung titingnan yung talagang participation, uh, yung, yung sinong pinaka extensive or substantial contribution in terms of Filipinos, uh, no, it would be Danilo S. Balete. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Nieves Capili, mm -hmm. were there also endemic murids identified from northern parts of Luzon. Maybe it, it's about the expeditions. Ah, okay. uh, northern Luzon. part of Luzon. Okay. Uh, endemic murids, of course, in what, what was found in, in the Cordilleras, uh, that's still considered as northern parts of Luzon. Uh, Cordilleras, uh, we did work in Mount Amuyao. So yung mga, yung Maseromis, um, Crotomies, Rincomies, uh, Batomies, so those, so those are endemic genera. Uh, and on, on Sierra Madre, we didn't find any Batomies, but we did find Archboldomies, Sericomies, Apomies, and yeah, Crotomies and Rincomies as well. So, so yeah, so, and a lot of these endemic genera of rodents were, uh, are only confined in, in, on Luzon Island. Hmm. Hindi kayo marinig, ma'am. But during this, the, the Spanish colonial period uh, and expeditions, were there already uh, mm -hmm. the spread periods from Northern Luzon? Uh, except for... for Galera lang, si Whitehead. Opo, no? Except for uh, Whitehead and Thomas. Although, si Whitehead nakapag-collect sa Isabela, mm -hmm. uh, that was the type specimen of Pronomis phalax, uh, 1894. So in description niya, uh, 300 meters, say some parch up forest, binaril daw niya. Ang liit na nukronomis na yun eh. Kaya nga. Siguro madami kasi. Kaling naman ito, sabi ko. So yeah, uh, other than that, wala. Okay, from again, from Che Shen Lim, did any of this collecting activity stimulate the scientists at those times to think about bio, geographic, and evolutionary ideas? I think you mentioned about <clears throat> Skater. Yes, Philip Skater. So, well, well, Philip Skater was uh, looking into the whole picture, you know, proposing six zoogeographic regions and took it to extreme na nag-propose ng isang continent pa between Madagascar and India to explain the presence of lemurs uh, sa India and Madagascar. Bakit wala sa Africa? So yung mga ganun tipo. But of course, Alfred Russell Wallace was also looking into some specimens when he was making yung kanyang, kanyang publication on evolution then uh, it was a different title uh, so yun na nga yun napansin niya is uh, from the Philippines uh, yung distinct lang is would be the flow in his Kumingay but uh, but uh, I forgot uh, Alfred Everett actually made a paper comparing yung fauna of Borneo and Palawan so but of course um Hindi pa masyadong, well, yung, the concept of biogeography was, wasn't really, really very uh, advanced at what we are seeing right now. Okay, thank you. From an anonymous attendee, I am fascinated with this cloud rats in the Philippines and uh, curious about what kind of diet they consume. Uh, I think uh, si Dr. Digea would be best positioned to answer that. 
Kung ano kinakain niya? <laughs> They're mainly herbivorous and they herbivorous. like, yeah, they, uh, gusto nila yung mga tender leaves, yung shoots. Ah, shoots of yeah. folivore talaga, ma'am, ano? Oo. Oh, oh, oh. uh, although they, they also, mahuhuli ma- din sila using, ano eh, ripe banana. Oh, uh, yeah. sa matiling. Uh, yeah. Tapos malaki po yung cage na gamit. Yeah. Um, malaking ba? Hmm. Okay. Interesting zoonosis. <laughs> <laughs> And another one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for the very informative presentation, sir. What do you think hinders our experts to do research in places you've stated, sir? Financial support, maybe? Places? Oh, what will be places? Um, yung, uh, yung mga, hindi, mga lugar? Yung hindi pa nasa survey? Uh, well, of course, in, in the Sulu Archipelago, Definitely. Although, uh, order. <laughs> oh, peace and order, definitely. I mean, uh, sa Basilan, Olo, uh, wala pa tayong mga records doon ulit. Uh, very recent records. Of course, Kester Yu, uh, if you know him, ma'am, a uh, friend of Danny, who are also working in Tawi-Tawi. Uh, he had some collections of, of rodents, I think, and, and some bats. in in Bongao and uh, unfortunately uh nandito pa rin sa Manila but I uh, we talk about it uh sometime and of course with the pandemic raging up pagkatapos ipapadala niya na sa sa sa, sa Field Museum uh, they've already had an agreement with Larry Heaney. Uh some parts of Western Mindanao definitely Sultan Kudarat uh, Maguindanao so these are mga mga gray areas halos wala pa tayong alam diyan for 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 mammals as well. Uh, Mindoro, of course, uh, with the recent expeditions. Palawan, of course. Uh, Samar, uh, surprisingly, and uh, wala pong masyadong ano, uh, mga recent publications on mammals there, definitely. And uh, yun na mention ko nga, the northern part of the Cordilleras, uh, wala pa rin po. Hmm. So what Hinders, what hinders, right? What hinders? <laughs> uh, workers, essentially. Uh, mammalogists, uh, looking into that. Uh, well, to be honest, kakonti pa lang din talaga yung mga mammalogists dito sa Pilipinas, and a lot of them are concentrated in on Luzon Island, uh, in Yupi Los Banos, in Yupi Diliman. Uh, in Mindanao, very, 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 very few. So, and in most cases, so we're dependent on, on foreign collaborations to do those research. So, and no, sorry, tao lang din, uh, wala masyadong tao uh, would work on these. So, yeah. So, compared with yung mga yung uh, with herpetology, na marami na talagang na, na, nag-work on her, non-herps, uh, essentially with, with the efforts of Ma'am Leti and, and, and si, si Academician Arvin. So, marami na nag-work on herps. Uh, surprisingly for mammals, uh, uh, definitely for bats, syempre, may marami na rin nagtatrabaho din. But in other uh, taxa ng mammals, wala, wala pa masyado. Nabawasan pa in recent no. years. Yeah, nabawasan pa. Dr. Perry Sab- Ong, James Alvarez, yung, Danny Balete. Sinabi ko siya na yun, sa yun, ma'am, nun eh. Na, <laughs> sabi mo pa, eh, huwag ka naman ganyan. <laughs> Ito pa lang okay. yung nababawasan nun, di ba? <laughs> yung, yung financial daw. Financial? Uh, well, grants. Do we get course. enough for support? Uh... Probably not. I mean, if you're looking into, I say, uh, this pag collect ng mammals, it doesn't end with collecting them per se. You also have to process them in the museum. So, marami din funds na it would involve yung curation mismo, uh, transferring to alcohol, taking care of that museum, uh, of that specimens, marami ka bang jars, marami ka bang mga alcohol, mga ganun, what have you, mga tags. And then, of course, you have to keep them for a definite period of time. And then it doesn't end with that. Uh, yung pagdadala ng mga tissue samples for anal- for genetic analysis. Yung mga gano- so, uh, medyo kulang ata. Eh. And uh, a lot of the, 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 the grant facilities would not fund a research on mammals only. It's always yung, yung ano eh, uh, integrative. So, if we're going to do biodiversity, So hindi nga lang then wildlife eh. so kasama din dapat may insects, merong may plants. And most of more often than not, the the the, the funds tend to water down eh. Medyo medyo it spread to thinly. Yeah. I mean with the, if you compare it with, with with the actual mammal serious mammal expedition, 
uh, that has been done. So, medyo yun, mababa na. So, this results to konting araw lang yung pagstay sa field. So, yung mga ganun. So, medyo mababa yung, yung funding din. It's not enough, actually. Okay, thank you. And our last question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, are there any marsupials found in no, the well, Philippines that exist today or is there any fossil record found? Wala po. Walang marsupials. Although may invasive ata yung sugar, ano? sugar, uh, sugar glider. glider. Marsupial yun ma'am, di ba? Oo. Oh, oh. oh, oh. Pet kasi. Oo, oh, oh, pet. So, pero fossil records, wala. It's very clear on that na uh, the marsupials only reach, well, of course, uh, Australia. And then, dun sa yung, the Wallace Line, west of the, uh, the east of the Wallace Line, dun sa between Bali and Lombok. Hanggang, hanggang ano lang sila, hanggang Lombok lang sila. Hindi na nakatawid. And that extended to the Philippines as well. Hindi nakaabot ng marsupials. Okay. Last question, Sir Philip. Bakit yung parang pangolin, walang, walang mention of the pangolin during the... Ah, meron, ma'am. Explorations. Actually, meron, ma'am. Ah, meron ba? Hindi ko, oh, hindi, hindi, hindi ko na sinama. Hindi ah, ko na sinama. okay. And, uh, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, mga, mga miscellaneous, uh, ano, like for example, yung iba pang mga species of squirrels, sunda mm. sa Eurus molendorfi, sunda sa Eurus robori, so um, hindi ko na naisama. Oo, oh, oh, kasi I was, I was going to mention that almost all of the orders that are currently recorded today were recorded during those explorations ano, oh. except for yun nga, yung pangbulin. So, pero, yung palalahat ng terrestrial. Pero meron ma'am, na, nakuha na rin yun ma'am nung, ano, nung, nung Spanish colonial yeah. period po. Hindi ko lang okay. na-mention. So, okay, so lahat no. Although, okay. sabi mo nga half were almost half were described during that time, during the 1800s. Yes ma'am. Right? Okay, so wala na po tayong tanong. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir Philip, so that was a great discussion for everyone. Uh, everyone, let us congratulate our speaker for a splendid presentation. And to show our gratitude for your talk, let me present you both, uh, both with this electronic certificate of uh, recognition, which reads, uh, Certificate of Recognition awarded to Professor Philip a. Alviola for serving as resource person during the 2021 MNH Baliktanao Kasaysayan at Kalikasan webinar series, Mammiferos Terrestris Conocidos de Filipinas, Philippine Mammalian Expeditions during the Spanish colonial period held on June 30, 2021, 10 a.m. to 11.30, signed by our director, Marian P. De Leon. Congratulations. Maraming thank you. Salamat, ma'am. Maraming salamat po. So let me now turn you over to our MC for the closing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pao. So before we end this webinar, let me give out a few reminders. So please evaluate the webinar to get the certificate of participation. The link is flashed on the screen and copied in the chat box of our Zoom webinar and the comments area of our YouTube live post. Please click on the link provided so that you will be able to uh, evaluate our webinar and we will only accept responses until 3 p.m. Okay, so we would like to thank the following organizations and the people uh, and people for all the support you have given us this morning in terms of resources and also inspiration. Thank you, Ma'am Jude. Thank you then, Sir Philip. Finally, uh, please follow the UPLB Museum of Natural History in social media. So we have uh, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So with that, uh, let us now take a break. We hope to see you in our next seminar entitled Malacological Collections During the Spanish Rule to be delivered by our curator, Dr. Emmanuel Ryan de Chavez on July 16. So please keep safe. Thank you and goodbye. So please make sure to log out of Zoom for security purposes. Again, maraming salamat po.